All right, well, again, uh, welcome and thank you. My name is Rick Dahlman. I'm Director of Data Center Architecture for Cable Express. Those of you who are not familiar with Cable Express, uh, we are a division of CX Tech and a sister company of Terakai. Uh, we're based here in Syracuse. Uh, we have four manufacturing operations across the country, one here in Syracuse, one in uh, North Jersey, one in Texas, and one in uh, Iowa. Um, so what our real value prop is in the marketplace is we get product to the door very quickly. And when I mean product to the door very quickly, any kind of fiber or copper infrastructure, everything from as dense as you want to be to as low dense as you want to be, to as many fibers as you want, to as least fibers as you want, and copper, the same version, okay? Before we get into what we're actually going to talk about here, the, the roadmap or the challenges to 400 gigabit, I'm sure a lot of people in here might only even be not even up to 10 gig yet. Um, however, these technology refreshes are going very quickly, um, whereas before it was maybe five years from, say, one gig to 10 gig. Now it seems like every year, every other year, we're getting up to the higher end speeds. Okay, so. What we focus on in the group that I manage in our division is I manage a team of architects and we're scattered throughout the country and we spend about 70% of our time internal to the data centers. And what we focus on is education and designing out infrastructure according to the TIA standards. Right? The real niche that we have in the marketplace as we go through what we're going to go through today um, is that number one, our architects engage, we'll come in and we'll maybe you know, evaluate what you have going on if you need us to do that. We will work with your team to design out your infrastructure according to what the standards state they need to be and or we'll do it for you if you want us to. Uh, I'll document it, I'll Visio draw it, I'll present you with the bill materials, all that is no charge, okay? With the hopes that you might buy something, all right? We have the strong belief that once we get involved with you and we educate you and the product set that we'll talk a little bit about today, um, the value prop that you'll, you'll see from us, it's an easy sale. Okay, competing against some of maybe the bigger guys that you might be familiar with. Okay, so anyway, let's get started. <clears throat> so, what we're going to talk about today and the challenges. So, I personally sit on the TIA board. I sit on four or five, five now, five different engineering committees that are responsible for writing the data center standards. Um, the good news is that I'm one of those guys that argues all the time because you wouldn't believe some of the arguments that I have to have ha that I have to have because. The standards board is consisted of guys like me from various different companies that are all trying to obviously steer the standards towards their particular companies. However, nobody, you can't be anything proprietary in a standards organization, obviously, or you won't be able to participate in the infrastructure. However, we preach a lot about the standards, but what is really, I guess, not well known is that the standards boards allow you to be flexible in your decision on what you're going to put in your infrastructure. They give you, for lack of a better term, a minimal requirement or a minimum requirement, okay? Then they leave it up to you on how extensive or how future protected you want to be, all right? Different manufacturers that participate in this marketplace will also then <clears throat> have various different product sets, product performance sets that they will offer and or sell to you, all right, that will bring you up to those certain levels or in some cases limit you in certain levels. It's our opinion that if you just follow those minimum requirements, your infrastructure will be obsoleted very quickly. And I'm going to show you a couple reasons why. All right. So we'll focus on that. Anyway, getting back to the standards. Right now, 400 gigabit, the standard is written. Okay, I know like, again, a lot of us are not anywhere close to that, but the standard is written, so we need to think about it. What will happen if in fact five years from now, you need to do something in your infrastructure that's gonna require 400 gigabit? Is your infrastructure ready? Will it be ready or will it be easily convertible to that infrastructure that you're gonna to need to run that? Okay, I would say the majority of us here, the answer probably would be no. And we'll go through some of those particular reasons why. Same thing applies to the fiber channel side of things. Fiber channel, although you know, a lot of people thought it was dead five years ago, it is strong as ever. Okay, the latency is fantastic to run our new high-speed applications. So that market is strong. And I know that's a typo for us. Right now we're talking 256 gigabit fiber channel for generation seven. Okay, so fiber channel and ethernet follow kind of the same principles as far as topologies and things of that sort. 
Okay, so when we talk, we're going to talk in conjunction with them. Those. We talked about, again, just meeting the standards. We're going to obsolete your infrastructure. Um, again, we talked a little bit about our manufacturing operations. I got a little ahead of myself, but all 100% based U.S. manufacturing we have. All right, and we're pretty proud of that because, again, when we design out infrastructure for your data centers or your network environments, we're going to make those cables specific to water. So if you want an 82.5 foot trunk, you're getting an 82.5 foot trunk at a particular fiber count, and we're going to make it from scratch when you buy it. All right? We tried numerous, or a lot of companies actually tried numerous ways over the years to stock particularly high fiber count cables. It's just simply not economical to do that. High fiber count cables have a lot of equity or dollars in those, and nobody ever wants them. All right, if I, if I stock a 100 footer, you guys are going to want a 120 footer. If I stock a 120 footer, you're going to want an 82 footer, and vice versa. It just doesn't work. All right, some companies and distributors will stock low fiber counts because you can hide lower count fiber easy, um, but not higher fiber counts in the design infrastructure that we're looking for. Okay, we'll talk about again what we're going to focus on, what's going to take us to 400 gigabit with lost budgets, and then offer you our way of a clear migration path to achieve those speeds. Not a bad summary sheet for one slide, right? All right. So before I move on to this next slide and tell you a little bit about, more about the company, <clears throat> we have every footprint that everybody else has, OK? But what we do have that they don't have is that the majority of our product sets are designed around specific machine types. I'm sure you might have heard the term port replication. A lot of companies kind of you know, have that uh, little acronym for that, but we trademarked the name, we brought it into the marketplace. Um, so for example, whether it's network or SAM, whether you're using Brocade EMC Dell, whether you're using Cisco, Arista, whoever it might be, you tell me who you're using, you tell me the blades that you're using, I have specific product sets designed exactly around those specific machines. I'm talking trunk cables that, again, route into that machine, the cable falls where it should be and it lays in very nice, it dresses in properly, and then wherever you bring that out to, I have an enclosure that looks exactly like that machine indoor director that you might be using in that exact same spot. Okay, so it gets you out of any active connectivity in front of the active blades where a lot of trouble happens. Okay, and it brings you out to a pass environment where you can operate and patch safely, which is what it's all about. All right. And we were recognized you know, over the last three out of the last four years for innovation awards, we're pretty proud of that around all these particular, particular product sets. Okay, so what we focus on to make sure that you're able to achieve these speeds up to 400 gigabit is we focus first of all on infrastructure design. All right. We wanna make sure when you put a backbone in, regardless of what you're doing on the front side, your machines and servers and switches and, and optics that you're using, you're gonna be able to migrate up to those 400 gigabit speeds. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. What's really key is the performance and the loss budgets or acceptable loss in those lengths that we have to achieve for those higher speeds. And we'll show you how to achieve those as well. This is the real critical factor as well. C-missile and cost-effective migration. We're gonna give you some examples at the end where if you follow the standards, you're gonna be in trouble when it comes to this because there's different ways of getting to those higher speeds that you might not be accustomed to. And you can't use the same product that you're using and be under the standards, okay? And then we'll talk a little bit about how we use it, okay? So, first of all, the cabling plant, right? This is what we focus on first when we get involved. Did I steal any pictures from anybody's data center here? No, yes, maybe, a little bit, all right, so. Those of you who have seen me before, you've probably seen some of these slides, but I assure you that these are not Photoshop, these are actual pictures of actual data centers that we see Okay, the names have been hidden to protect the, to protect the, uh, to jobs, so to speak, right? <clears throat> but the simple fact is, is that this is more the norm than the exception in a lot of cases, right? So we want to try to avoid that, all right? Because you know what happens, right? You know, it, you know, I've seen people lose jobs over snagging a piece of fiber and becoming unplugged, and they use mil lose millions of dollars of revenue for 10 minutes of downtime. Those are things we want to try to avoid. So, you know, they unplug them, they're afraid to pull it out for any snags, and they put more cable in, it builds on top of it itself and another, and it keeps going and going and going. We want to try to avoid that. Besides the fact if we're trying to achieve a high performance infrastructure, all of a sudden all this pressure on top of fiber starts putting little intrinsic loss points in the cables, and we start generating little DBs all over the place, or DB losses, which are going to generate channel errors, especially as we migrate up through those speeds. All right? So, 
Again, what we follow and what our architects will help you do is design out a system according to what the standards state. Okay? Now this works, the great thing about it is it works with our old school stuff, whether it's two layer or three layer. It works with spine and leaf type design or anything that you might be trying to achieve moving forward. We will follow this and I guarantee once we put this in and establish a design and or plan moving forward, your infrastructure will be laid in. You won't have to make any major changes unless you go through a major data center expansion. All right? And you won't have to touch that back end infrastructure. You'll manage everything up front. Okay? This gives you an example. And the reason why this is so great, it doesn't matter if you have literally two racks in your network room, okay, or you have 200 in your bigger data center. This is both expandable and collapsible across the board. Okay? It can be built in many layers, okay, depending on where you need port distribution. Okay? If, for example, we need connectivity in every single cabinet you have, we do that. If you don't, maybe we do it on the edge. Maybe we put it in the middle. But we make a plan for not only your current usage on what you think about needed, but we look towards the future, and that's the key. Where do you think you're going to be in the future? Okay? This, again, has to be expandable very quickly, and there has to be collapsible very quickly. Okay? Depending on who you talk to, depending on the technology that you might need. You might need more fiber ports, or you might need a heck of a lot less fiber ports. Okay? So we want to make sure <clears throat> that either way, it's convertible. All right? But when things are done properly, okay, with, again, those products that are specifically designed around machines, those particular things can be achieved very easily. Okay? And here's some examples. Here's a uh, uh, Cisco 70, uh, 76, uh, 77, uh, 9710 sand director. Yeah, 384 ports. Doesn't look so bad. All right? Here's a new Brocade X6 director, cable with QSFP ports. Your FC32 1664 blades, all right, cable pretty nicely. Here's one done with harnesses, 384 ports. So when done properly with the proper product, it's easy to keep it and maintain it well. Right. Any questions on design aspect? Okay, your standards. As mentioned earlier, the IEEE runs the Ethernet side of the equation for transmission speeds. Back in 2010, it was a game changer for, for those of us that have been around for a while, right? So in 2010, they ratified the 140 and 100 gigabit standards. All right, it was 10 gig up until then. <clears throat> Back in 2010, the optics weren't that, well, I shouldn't say weren't that good. They were good for the time, but they weren't that speedy. At that time, you could get about maybe 13 gigabit down a specific fiber, and that was about the top end of the speed that you were getting, all right? So in order to achieve 40 gig at, at the time, they had to go away from our simple transmit and receive path, and they had to go over to multiple paths or parallel optics. So introducing the MPO, or most of us know it as the MTP brand name connector, okay, was, I guess, for lack of a better term, put in mass in the two data centers. It's been around for actually 25 years, but not a lot of people used it. They stayed away from it because it was a difficult connector to make work well. All right. For 100 gigabit, they use a double row MPO connector transmitting 10 lanes and receiving 10 lanes in one connector. Hence, 10 lanes and 10 gigabit, 100 gig. Okay. We migrated right along to 2015 when the next rendition of the standard, or update to the standard came out. <clears throat> the optics got better and we were able to achieve 25 gigabits a lane. So bye bye went the double row MPO and back to your standard MPO connector, which is most of us are familiar with the 12 or the 8s, okay? And you're able to achieve now 100 gig in one MPO connector. Now, also during this time, Cisco, at the time proprietary nonetheless, introduced what they refer to as BiDi, which they were, all, what they were able to achieve 40 gigabit over duplex, or a, an LC connector, transmit and receive. What they would do is exactly what it states, it's bidirectional. They would shoot 20 gigabit in one way, 20 gigabit in the other, achieving 40 gigabit on the lines. Okay? They also, what was I think last year, finally released 100 gigabit by die. Okay? We'll see if they can achieve any more higher speeds. I think it's going to be hairy, but we'll see as far as by die technology goes. But long and short of it is, again, and remember this, you have a choice of ways to get to the higher speeds. 
Okay. <clears throat> Just released last year in 2017, 200 and 400 gigabit. Okay. Now, this is going to be interesting because again, what it goes into is a, since the optics are kind of where they're at right now. <clears throat> they're at a maximum speed. Right now they're achieving, well it's not released, but they're achieving 25 gig, but they're starting to achieve 50 gig over one fiber, okay? So as those speeds migrate, there are less lanes that we're gonna need, but right now we need eight lanes to achieve 400 gigabit. So now the MPO is up to a 16 position, okay? Now, this is very important because now you're saying, okay, well we had a 24, we have a 12, now we have a 16, but you can see where this is going and my point of the matter of putting a proper infrastructure in on the back side because the optics out front, not only are they constantly changing and upgrading, okay, but you're gonna to have to be flexible. And if you put that infrastructure on the back side where it doesn't matter what you're using on the front side, that's what it's all about. And that's what we try to achieve. Regardless of what you're doing on the front side and how you achieve it, we're gonna be able to do it on the back side, okay? <clears throat> Second critical factor in these higher speeds is you notice the acceptable loss budget of these links, okay? They're starting to get pretty low, all right? Those of you are familiar with DB loss on standard loss on the connectors, you'll so, you, you soon see that this doesn't afford you a lot of room, okay? You plug a couple connectors in and all of a sudden you're kind of at the maximum point. Then if you start putting more interconnects in to manage your product set, you're starting to really get hairy. Okay. The good news is that as we go up in speeds, the loss budget for these characteristics still remain about the same. Okay, so it really it's really boiling down to, okay, now we need to just make sure that we achieve a very high quality product when we're putting this together to assure that we're gonna be able to meet these minimum loss budgets across the board, all right? Also the good news is that the distances are remaining pretty consistent for Multima. Not huge by any means, okay, but pretty consistent. Now, I'll throw a monkey wrench into the equation here for you. Right, so, if somebody came up to me and asked my professional opinion, since I've been doing this for quite some time, and they said, hey Rick, if you had unlimited funds, what would you, how would you build your data center, or how would you build your data center's infrastructure? And I said, I put all single mode in. Why would you do that? Well, number one, Single mode is actually about only 70% the cost of multi-mode as far as cable goes. Okay, so I would save 30% on my data center inf fiber infrastructure. 30% savings is not bad, okay? Second, the bandwidth's unlimited. There's nothing that's ever gonna be invented, probably in my lifetime, that'll ever be able to fill that pike up on that one single mode strand of glass, okay? That's great, I'll never have to worry about that, right? Because think about it, what are we doing on the multi-mode side of the equation? Just like I said, well, we have to put an infrastructure in on the, on the back side and I have to be able to make sure that I'm able to do it several different ways on the front side because they keep adding more lanes or less lanes in order to achieve this. Single mode, I put it in once, I'm done, okay? Now, the downside to it was that it was, the transceivers are super expensive, right? So I can't put a thousand ports of single mode LR transceivers in my data center, okay? Because then I would obviously get fired pretty quickly for spending all that money, right? So, <clears throat> the big guys, a couple years ago, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon went to the standards guys that make transceivers and they say, listen, I can't keep changing my multi-mode stuff in my, my data centers to achieve all this throughput data that I need, okay? Something needs to be done. So they took a little example from DAC cables. You got anybody familiar with copper DAC cables? Okay, 40 gigabit copper, all right? If any of you are not, but if you buy one, for example, and you, if they're for a short distance, right? So if you buy a one meter cable, it's super cheap, right? You go to a two meter, all of a sudden you see like a logarithmic scale price spike. You're like, what the heck is this going on? And then you buy a three meter, same principle, right? Reason being is because for lack of a better term, again, they sell you a tuned cable, meaning well, if it only has to go one meter, this can be a pretty crappy cable, so I can use crappy components, right? Here you go. Now if it goes two meters, oh man, now I gotta have, gotta have better shielding, I gotta have be a better EMI protection on the end, I gotta work the components a little bit better, maybe I can't have the, the Chinese people solder, I have to go through a wave solder, whatever it might be, but the price goes up. And same thing with three meter, okay? 
So they actually took a little bit of a cue from that and they said, listen, let's pick a standard, okay, that'll cover, say, every, every data center in the world internally. And we're gonna settle on 500 meters. That'll cover any distance inside of any data center. Okay, now, if I only need to go 500 meters and not two kilometers, which these regular LR transceivers can do, wouldn't that reduce, can you dummy down the, the lasers in there to make a cheaper transceiver? Said, oh yeah, we can do that, and they did. Hence the standard was born for short reach single mode, okay, which can go 500 meters internal to a data center. So now all of a sudden, you have another choice to get to the higher speeds, okay? Now, <clears throat> if you take a Cisco list cost price on a 100 gig single mode transceiver for the SR technology for this single mode, short reach single mode, and compare it to the multi-mode standard from Cisco, it's the same price. So your transceivers now don't cost any different. What are you gonna do? Choices, okay? <clears throat> Again, going up higher into the 400 gigabit spectrum, I can tell you from a standards perspective, it's to get back down to the eight by or standard MTP connector, okay? The eventual technology will be 100 gigabits or trying to achieve 100 gigabits per pipe or per line. So therefore you can get back to the standard MPO connector. But right now we have to focus on a 16 position. And just like the 24, it's not intermatable with each other, okay? So you're gonna to have to have split out cables or breakout cables or conversion cables, however you guys want to refer to them as, okay? But then, those of you who are familiar with MPO technology, you gotta to have to start worrying about fiber paths, because now you're dealing with multiple fibers, and you're gonna to have to start worrying about genders, because every time that you plug an MPO connector together, you have alignment pins. The reason you have alignment pins is because you have so many fibers in such a small uh, pitch next to each other in order to achieve proper mateability, because the whole thing about fiber optics is geometries on the glass and how they align when they mate. Okay, and if, if for a multiple fiber connector, it's very difficult to try to align those. So you need a female and male on each particular side in order to achieve proper throughput through those particular connectors. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, now, let me throw one more monkey wrench into the equation for you. Okay, so, last year, OM5 was released. Now, I'm, I'm sure most people are familiar with OM4, right? All right. That's the latest multi-mode spec that was out there. Last year, OM5, or what they referred to as short wave division multiplexing, multi-mode glass, was put on the marketplace and also ratified by all the standards organizations. Okay? So we should all say, well, we should all put OM5 in. Not so fast. Okay? So besides the fact that right now OM5 glass is about double the cost of OM4, okay, is it worth it besides being a pretty lime green color? Okay, well, that's debatable, all right? If, uh, so for example, the cable that we use, the glass inside is from Corning. Corning makes the best glass, I think, hands down, no arguments, right? Corning will tell you, well, hey, Rick, shh, don't tell anybody, but our OM5 glass is the same as our OM4 glass. Our OM4 glass is the same as our OM3 glass. We make one glass. Really? Yeah, really. Even back in the day? Yeah, back in the day. <laughs> So what happens is, for example, Corning extrudes this piece of glass, okay, and they put it on the testers and they flick the tester switch and basically has to do with their in-circle flux and the 10 different Vixel profiles that they shoot down the line and they test it. They say, oh, okay, does this achieve OM5 standards? Yeah, OM5 glass. Does it achieve OM4 specs? Yeah, OM4 glass. Does it achieve OM3? Yeah, OM3 glass. But their process is so good, well, it's all that glass. Okay, so they say, oh, hey, today we have, I don't know, all the demand for OM4. Okay, well, that's OM4 glass. All this is today OM5 glass, and so on and so forth, and then they price according to the market. Okay, now, other companies will tell you that they have different glass for their OM5, okay, which is true, okay, but here's the thing, and this, and this will tell you because of how the standard is written, all right? So, <clears throat> before I go there, I'll tell you exactly what OM5 is, okay? OM5 is a technology that's taken from single mode, which uses wave division multiplexing, which means is, instead of using a MTP connector that transmits multiple lanes of signal over multiple lanes of fiber, this transmits multiple signals over one piece of glass over multiple wavelengths. Did I say that right? I think so. So what they use is they use the 850 wavelength that we're all familiar with in multi-mode, okay? And they use, I think, 850, 873, 910, and 953, 
Okay, now, again, the corning guys say, the wavelengths were already there in the old glass. That's why. If you look at any of the standards on OM4 glass, and even OM3 for that matter, OM2, whatever it might be, you look, they always gave you two windows, right? They gave you 850 and 1300. You'll see better bandwidth characteristics and lower loss between 850 and 1300. That's exactly what's occurring here. You'll see better performance at the next wavelength they use, and the next wavelength they use, and the next wavelength they use, and the next wavelength they use, okay? Also, the way the standard is written, okay, the testing that is required to test infrastructure for OM5 is no different of a test that they do for OM4. They don't say you have to test all four windows. They say when you're testing worst case scenarios, so the worst performance of that piece of glass will be on 850 nanometers. The best performance that you'll get will be on 953. So if you take the loss from your 850, which is what you do for OM4, that'll be better than anything that you have on those other ones, so that's what we're gonna go for a maximum loss. That's one. Number two, for 100 gigabit, and 400, and four, I haven't seen a 400 gigabit specs, but 100 gigabit, all right, there is no difference in performance between OM4 or OM5 when you're using a 850 nanometer type optic, meaning anything that's an IEEE standard right now. Because the wave division multiplexing transceivers, the SWDM4 is not a standardized product yet, okay? The only benefit that OM5 has, okay, is in fact, if you're gonna use a wave division multiplexing transceiver, it'll give you an extra 25 to 50 meters of distance. That's the only advantage, okay? So, right now, there's not too many of these transceivers on the marketplace, number one. They're coming, okay, so they're making them, so they're coming. Eventually, OM5 pricing will probably come down, okay? So then, at, therefore, you make a decision what's more, most cost effective to start, you know, maybe putting OM5 as a standard product or offering both for a given time. But you have to take into consideration, is it really going to give you any kind of an advantage to use it and to spend double the amount of money now in order to do it, okay? If, in fact, you're going to just maybe expand what you have in your current data center, it's not a complete rip and replace, all right? Because in order to use this and achieve the benefits of OM5, you have to use every single new transceiver in this to get any benefit. But you got to ask yourself the question, in my data center, in the majority of our data centers, do I need to go more than 100 meters? The answer to that question, unless you're Google, Facebook, or Microsoft, is no. So why would you want to use it and spend more money? So that's a question. But the advantage of OM5, I mean, is, it's simple, right? Less lanes of fiber, less glass, less cable. So some people will argue, especially the OM5 pushers, will say, well, listen, I know it's twice as expensive as multi-mode, but you only have to put one-fourth of it in to achieve those speeds. Well, yeah, you're right. However, the transceivers will cost you a lot more now. So it's like I said, those are the kind of homework questions that you're gonna do. But regardless of it, is the infrastructure on the backside needs to work for you guys. And that's my argument at the standards board all the time. Listen, just give them a product they can buy and use. Okay, I shouldn't, they shouldn't have to concern themselves. They should be able to buy a product from me, buy a product from Corning, buy a product from whoever else and plug it together and all should work, does it? The majority of you guys know that's not the case, right? All right, I think we covered this. You know the advantages, I won't bore you with that, okay? But this is here now. That's the only thing that I can tell you without, again, reading the exact lines from the, from the slides here, okay? It's here, it's coming quick. We already have customers that are pushing these speeds. Um, you know, our port count for 100 gig, for example, that we put out the door every single day is, is ridiculous. It's skyrocketing for us, okay? Because the costs are coming down, the migration's happening faster and faster and faster. So I just urge you to be prepared, okay? Here's a, here's a specific example from, you know, 40 to 400 gigabit as far as design process goes for us, all right? Well, obviously we have a core type switch there, okay? Now, think about this. Do you think maybe a 400 gigabit optic would be more cost effective if I could break it out to say four 400 gig or four 100 gigabits or buy four 100 gigabit transceivers? All right, it'd probably be a lot more cost effective for us to buy one 400 gigabit and then split it out to utilize, for example, the Leafs at 100 gigabit and bring, again, those back to the spine. Switch. Okay, and that's in fact what you're start going to see. That's what happened in the 40 to 100 gig ranges where, you know, we're obviously we're, we're at a higher speed at the cores, 
and then you know breaking it out. And that's what the beauty of this standard is. You can break it out. For wave division multiplexing, you can't do that. One signal is one signal. So you can't break out that into multiple various different speeds. All right, same thing with BiDi. BiDi, if you're using 40 gig, using 100 gig, that's what you have. You can't break it out. Okay? The beauty of the standard is, again, you can break it out, so it makes it cost effective for us. Okay? Now, I mentioned again, fiber channel follows the same path as Ethernet. Okay? So the same concerns we have there. So right now at Generation 6, I mean, we're shipping, we've been shipping 32 gigabit fiber channel okay, for the specific machines and have to make these links work. Okay? They use a combination of LC-based product and MPO or QSFP-based optics. All right, so you got that conversion factor back and forth from parallel to serial transmissions. Okay, generation seven is out. All right, they're going up to 256 gigabit. Okay, so the, so the speeds are here. They're here today, and that's that's what we need to pay attention to. Okay, and then you have a whole laundry list of concerns that you have to come in. Fiber channel performances, okay? Your, your loss budgets are down in the 1.5s. Okay. Anybody know the standard for an LC connector? Piece of trivia? So if you were to buy an LC cable from a, any generic vendor out there and you got the, the loss ratings on the jumper, anybody? Anybody? It'd be 0.5 per mated pair is what the standard is. So looking at this, how many LC connections could you have in that link before you blew that budget? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Three. Right. So it doesn't afford you a lot of room. Okay. Now, if I tell you that the standard for an MPO product in the marketplace, and according to the standards, the ID, the TIA 568.3-D document is 0.75 per mated pair. Same question. How many MPOs can you have in a link? Two. Correct. Well, how would you break that out to an LC then and be under the standard? Couldn't, right? Things, things, to, things to make you go, mm, right? <laughs> they made a song about that, I think. Anyway, all right. So, all right. So, getting back to how we want to design out systems, right? We want to cable things that are active and get you away from the switch and bring you out to passive environments, okay, to help you manage your infrastructure, okay? Or we wind up at those beginning slides of those pictures. Simple as that. In order to do that, we need interconnects, all right? So how are we, go how are we supposed to achieve that? Well, here's how we achieve it. In the marketplace, and, and this is regardless of who you might be dealing with, okay? unless you're dealing with smaller type companies or mom and pop shops, okay, is that the companies do offer higher performance product, okay, but they also charge for that higher performance product, okay, and the cost differences are quite substantial, all right. Why is that? Has anybody ever looked toward a fiber manufacturing facility by any chance? Nobody? Okay, so let you in a little bit of secret, okay? So fiber, it's big high-tech stuff, right? High, 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 high-tech, right? The way they put it together is actually very low-tech, okay? A lot of hands-on involvement. There's tons of different components affected by thousands of different things, okay, that can make a piece of fiber go bad quickly. Second bad thing about manufacturing a fiber optic assembly is that once you put the connector on, because you're basically putting epoxy in this connector and that's what holds it on the glass, okay? Once that cures, Okay, it goes through a polishing step or two polishing steps, depending on how many polishing steps that you're using, right? And remember I told you about fiber performance, right? It all has to do with the geometries on that glass. If you ever seen a fiber optic connector and you looked at it, well, don't look at it. But if you ever looked at it, if you ever rubbed your finger over the ferrule, you don't really feel anything. There's actually a piece of glass that sticks out. There's supposed to be a piece of glass that sticks out. Okay, they refer to that as fiber protrusion. Okay, and that has all kind of geometry characteristics on it. Besides the geometry characteristics that are on it, it also has certain alignments where it sits in the ferrule and everything else, right? And then when you mate it together with another one, okay, it actually, inside of that adapter, it actually, the two pieces of glass actually mate together. Okay, so the pieces of glass actually touch. All right, so anyway, what I'm getting to is that in order for that thing to be aligned properly, in order for that thing to be polished correctly, to perform at a certain level, Okay, your processes all through the system, since there's so many hands-on involvement in it, right, have to be pretty precise and repeatable. Because guess what? 
Once it gets polished and you put it in a tester and it doesn't test right, like so for example, if I do it and I test it and it's say, say 0.5 or 0.75, okay, I just met the standard, that's cool, but it's at 0.75 or, so, or a little bit under there, right? But now I'm like, okay, well, I really need to make a better performing product. I plug it in and it's not at 0.5, for example, if I want to say my lame limb is 0.5, all right? There's not a lot you can do. You can't repolish it, because if I repolish it, all of a sudden then I just change all the fiber geometries on everything. And that's not going to work. And now I'm cutting the glass down and I'm creating an air gap. And when fiber hits air, it scatters. Or light hits air, it scatters. All right? So you can't make the connector better. If there's a piece, piece of dirt on it, well sure, you clean the dirt off, it might perform better. But you can't change the geometries and make it perform better. So guess what happens? What do you, how do you think they make that, if they're selling you a higher performance product, how do you think they make that work better? cut it off and start all over again. So now you have all that labor involved plus the cost of goods to put that connector on to try it all over again. Okay? So the reason these companies charge you higher amounts of money for those particular higher performing products is because their waste level is so great that they have to charge more in order to be a profitable company, which we hopefully all are. All right? Here's our standard product. This is what we're good at. Okay. <clears throat> A whole nother presentation could be on what our standards are and how we manufacture and all this, but long and short of it is, this is our standard product out the door. We lead the world. This is what we're pretty darn proud of. All right? LCs are maximum at dot one five per mated pair. We don't talk typical, okay? A lot of people out of our competition say, well, typically our stuff performs at like a real low level. I'm like, well, typically our stuff is so good I give you light back. How about that? <laughs> people usually think that's funny. I actually had a case at Verizon where we tested it, and we actually proved that we gave them light back. She was testing it wrong, but it still was pretty, <laughs> it, was still, it was still pretty cool. Anyway, <laughs> and our MPOs are at dot two per mated pair, and that's max. And when I tell you that if we want to talk typical, I can tell you that the typical stuff is down way low, okay? So what it boils down to, for standard product, Okay, I can give you a heck of a lot in, internal to your links and still beat at that 400 gigabit level to assure that you're going to be able to work. And that's the value that we that's the value that we offer. Okay, the cool thing about this as well. So again, we put the assemblies together. We don't make the fiber. We don't make the cable. We don't make the connectors. Okay, our our expertise comes in putting it together and terminating it. Okay, so we use M MTP connectors because frankly, US Connect makes the best M MPO connector, the best ferrules with the best tolerances. Okay. Even U.S. Connect says, how the heck are you guys doing that? They can't even make their connector work that well. Okay, so we're pretty proud of that. Anyway, all right, so the last thing I'll bore you with today, okay, and this is, my, and, and you, I got a couple of coworkers here and my boss, okay, that this has been my little pet project in P for a few years, now, and I'll tell you what it is. Okay, so if any of you guys are familiar with the standards, so you bought MPO product before, or just LC product, or had the pleasure of flipping pairs back and forth inside your networks or data centers and cursed a bunch of people, I'm your guy, okay? One, I tell the story 20 years ago, yeah, probably 20 years ago, when SC connectors were first on the marketplace, okay? An SC connector is a duplex connector. Anybody, everybody familiar with an SC connector? That was before the LC connector, okay? And the connectors are clipped together. Okay, well, my manufacturing line was an IBM supplier, okay? IBM said, here's the standard, this is the way the standard is, this is the way the cable's supposed to work, and that's it. But I had customers buying my SC product, okay, and then calling and yelling at me because they couldn't split the cable apart, and they were breaking the connectors by splitting the cable. I'm like, well, hey, it's not supposed to be split apart. It's a duplex connector. It doesn't matter if you're plugging three connectors or 3,033 connectors, when you use my product, you'll always be at the right spot. You'll never, ever have to flip a pair. We all know where that went in the marketplace, right? All right, so when I tell you that it's only gotten worse, okay, so again, getting back to the standards organizations that I preach and are a part of, okay, they say that there's three allowable methods that you can use in order to cable your data center, okay? Every single one of them are different, okay? None of them benefit you. All right, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> and this is what they refer to as method B. So there's method A, method B, and method C. Method A, if anybody talks to you about method A, run. Shut your door, do not talk to them, do not ever call them back, okay? It is the worst thing that they could possibly do to you. Method A is basically a straight fiber path through everywhere 
okay? And it makes you flip a pair wherever you don't want to flip a pair. And then the next people come in, you have to flip a pair someplace else, okay? Method B, I don't think is any better, okay? Method B requires you to, in the duplex scenario, okay, have two different cassette modules, an A side and a B side, or a core side and an edge side, okay? Thank God it's not method A, and they at least let you use the same jumper, okay? But you still have to have two different products, all right? However, now, remember what I told you where we talked about there's many ways to get to those higher speeds, all right? So, say I use standard space technology and I need parallel optics. Well, look at this all of a sudden now. If you use method B and I need parallel, all of a sudden, I know you can't see it too well, but this is a male MPO on the back of here. Here, it's a female MPO on the back of there. So if you need to follow the standard, all of a sudden, you're not in standard. In order to migrate here, all of a sudden, you have to start using non-standard product, meaning if you need to patch something, okay, you would then need, if you're using here, anytime you plugged an MPO cable into here, this side would have to be male. So then you would have to have a male to female MPO. Okay, however, if I had a machine and I had an MPO, MPO cable, and I had to plug those two things together, I couldn't use it because internal to the machines, the transceivers have pins. So I wouldn't be able to use that cable. So now all of a sudden, I'm stocking two different cables, jumper cables again. My infrastructure is not standard. Then if I'm on this side and I say, okay, well, I started with parallel. That's great. At least I can use the same jumper. But now, hey, I'm going to use duplex technology now. Well, now all of a sudden I have to now use pins on this side or a cassette module. Well, most cassette modules I buy from my vendors are male on the inside. But I can't use that because I have male pins there. What am I going to do? Now I've got to rip and replace. Okay? So it's not cost effective. It's non-migratable. Okay? So my little self out of Syracuse, New York, goes before the TIA board, and I say, hey, I got this great idea. Okay, it's pretty simple. Okay, I'm gonna call it multipath. All right, what it, what's it do? Well, it's great. Customer only buys one trunk cable ever, buys one cassette module ever, buys one jumper cable ever, and it'll work in every single scenario across the board, whether you're parallel or whether you're duplex. It's a pretty good idea, right? If, if, we're, if, if done properly and they work it, you know, not that I want you to but you could buy a trunk cable from me, a cassette module from Corning, and a jumper cable from whoever. Not that, again, not that I want you to. You plug it all in, it works. Wouldn't that be something? Guess how many people voted for it? Not that, thank you, you said two. There was, yeah, there actually was two. Myself and, believe it or not, a guy from Corning. 62 people said no. Why is that? Because they want to keep you proprietary. They don't want you using or making it simple for anything. They want you to have to rip and replace. That's how much they care about you. Okay? So, <clears throat> this is our standard way of doing things. Okay? And the reason being is, so give you an example. One thing that we're super flexible with with manufacturing when it comes to us, listen, if you need us to help you out and you have a certain type of infrastructure, I can make your product work. Meaning is, if you're using Corning, I can make my stuff work with Corning stuff. Simple for me. Okay, simple, all right? I can make my stuff work with, for example, comp scopes, simple. I have the flexibility to do that, all right? But I'd rather give you something that doesn't matter what you use, it's standard. This is, you know, I, it's not proprietary, we released it to the marketplace. So it's not a proprietary technology, and it's simple, okay? But you'll never have to worry about a gender on an MPO connector again. No matter where you're plugging, it's getting back to that old file of the standard. Wherever you need a connection, you'll be at the right spot with the right gender and the right fiber path. Never have to flip a pair, never have to worry about gender, nothing, okay? It's a perfect solution that was voted down by 60 people. And I think it's a better story that it was voted down by 60 people because it just gives me something to talk about, right? So anyway, <clears throat> that's what we don't want to have happen. Anyway, all right, if anybody's interested, again, um, we back up what we say, okay? have standards documents and qualification documents that I urge you that if you're interested, you know, and whoever you're using, just put them side by side and flip a couple pages. I think you'll quickly see the differentiating factors between us and whoever you might be using, okay? And don't let a cost factor get in the way. Um, 
any of the people that are out there, unless you're buying offshore product, which I urge you not to, um, we're going to beat them. We're manufactured direct. We don't go through distribution. I think you'll find it's quite cost effective for what you're getting, especially their performance levels. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Was I better than a 12 year old? <laughs> we don't know, right? <laughs> uh, well, listen, thank you very much.